Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 10 of Mr. McKenzie's Distance Learning, The Cause and Effects of 20th Century Wars, Causes of the Spanish Civil War. We are back on to Paper 2 content. Let's begin now. So here's a, just a quick little overview of things we will be discussing in this lecture. We're going to be discussing the sides fighting, both sides that are fighting this civil war. We'll look at the Republican side and we'll look at the nationalist side. And of course, we're going to see the foreign involvement that gets, in, gets on board with this civil war as well. We'll be talking about long-term causes as well as short-term causes. So before we get into the long and short term causes and the sides fighting this war, I want to take a couple of minutes to really just kind of discuss what we already know about Spain. We should know geographically where it's situated. But what else do we know about Spain's long history? For that, let's kind of dive real quick back to the Middle Ages. Uh, this stuff you don't really need to know for a paper two, but it does really just add a little bit of background information on on Spain. Since the Middle Ages, Spain has been very Catholic and has been ruled by a monarchy. These are old world institutions, very powerful, very conservative institutions long held in Spain. Very Catholic and ruled by a monarch. So we're going to see the, the nationalist side of this civil war that is going to be uh, more conservative, is going to be on, on the side of the Catholic Church and the monarchy. For much of its history, Spain has had a huge empire. We know during the time of exploration, Spain sent its explorers out to find more trade routes and whatnot and controlled many colonies around the world. But it slowly started to decline after the 17th century. By the time we get to uh, 1920, Spain becomes a constitutional monarchy. Okay, so why did Spain have a civil war? Well, here in Spain, we see neighbor fighting neighbor, peasants fighting local authorities. What this war really became was a, a kind of a testing ground. It, it tested out new ideological directions for Spain. We see communism, Republican, republicanism, and fascism. All these kind of different isms that were popping up in the in 1920s and 30s was going to strike an ideological chord with the people within Spain. So these ideologies, particularly communism and fascism, which were becoming more popular during the 20s and 30s, really transformed this civil war into an international war. Because obviously we're going to see a lot of foreign involvement and foreign intervention in this uh, civil war. For the, the, the side of Spain that allied them alongside the communists, we see the Soviet Union getting involved. For the nationalist side, that was, uh, we see them kind of cozying up to the fascists like Mussolini and Adolf Hitler. So Germany and Italy are going to support the Spanish fascist side, which is going to be more of the nationalist side. And the Soviet Union is going to support the communists uh, in Spain. And the communists are going to find themselves on the Republican side of this civil war. So a lot of foreign involvement in this war. So the Spanish people all of a sudden are caught now in the middle of a proxy war between these two totalitarian systems of communism on one side and fascism on the other. And the Spanish Civil War, which takes place from 1936 uh, to 1939, really becomes a testing ground for the war to come. We're going to see the tactics um, of Blitzkrieg being used for the first time in the Spanish Civil War. So this is really the prelude to World War II. 
And even though the kind of Western democracies aren't officially getting involved, though they will send some, volu some volunteers from those countries, will enlist, they are observing this war. They're going to see how the next war is going to be fought. So now we're going to discuss the sides fighting the Spanish Civil War. Who found themselves on which side? So we're going to have the left side, and then we're going to have the right side of our kind of political spectrum here. So on the left side, we're going to have what's known as the Popular Front. And here we have kind of the elected government of Spain. The Popular Front was kind of the elected uh, government. It was also a pact of all these left-wing political parties. It's a mixture of center and left-wing political parties. Republicans wanted a liberal Spanish government. So the re Republicans were on the left side. So we can't really think of Republicans in the more... Uh, like how we would think like Republicans in, in the United States. It's not really the same thing. It's Republicans more in the kind of classical sense of that they are fighting for a republic. So the Republicans want to find a liberal Spanish republic. And they're joined by the communists as well. Even the an anarchist political group uh, known as the CNT were also joining as well. So on the left side... The Popular Front, the elected standing government of Spain, and it was a mixture of center and left-wing political parties. It was made up of Republicans, Communists, and even Anarchists as well. On the right side, we have what's known as the National Front. So the right side, we really have the Nationalists, the National Front. And we have... People on the, uh, find themselves on the right side are monarchists in support of the monarchy. They are uh, in favor of the Catholic Church. We see uh, really a confederation of conservative parties, which is going to be known as CEDA, Confederation of Conservative Parties. The leader of CEDA really had fascist leanings and was really inspired by Hitler. By 1933, the Falange Party, the Falange Party, um, was formed, largely supported by the army and wealthy land-owning upper class. So, Spain finds itself divided into two fronts. Republicans and liberals and socialists, as well as even communists, find themselves on the left wing. Conservative and nationalist and fascist groups find themselves on the right. This division was from long-term effects within Spanish society. So now we're going to take a look at really the main long-term causes. So a quick little overview of some of the long-term causes we're going to be discussing. We're going to first look at a poor economy, how the poor economy within Spain is going to create divisions within Spain. So we're going to see division within society, division between the rich and the poor. We're going to see regional differences. Different areas of Spain will have more leanings to different ideologies. So we'll look at that as well in long-term causes. Spain had a gradual decline as a colonial power all through the 1800s. So we look at 1823, a series of revolutions in Spain, Spanish colonies in South America. 1898, Spain lost Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. So the gradual decline of the Spanish Empire has been continuing really since the 17th century into the 1800s, leading up into the turn of the century. Spain is, as a colonial power, on the decline.
1875, Spanish monarchy had been restored. So we find ourselves in an era of, of restoration after seven years of Republican rule. 1921, the Spanish colony of Morocco rebelled, killing about 7,000 Spanish soldiers. And as a result, this led to a domestic crisis. King Alfonso XIII, the guy you kind of saw the first, um, the first image there on the screen, King Alfonso XIII, he abdicates in 1931. And he left behind a Spain with only one colony, a weak army, and no real economic growth. After the defeat of the Moroccan rebels, General, uh, General Miguel Primo de, de Rivera, okay, General Miguel Primo de Rivera, seen here in the in the foreground there, in 1923 performed a coup d'état and ran the country as a dictatorship. Now, under the leadership of de Rivera, we do see some improvements. He brings in some reforms. We see dams being built. We see increased hydroelectricity and an overall improvement to transportation. But throughout the 19th century, Spain had not been able to industrialize as much of as the rest of Europe had. Spain was an agricultural country with 60% of the land being owned by 6% of the population. So we see in Spain there's no real middle class. In Spain the peasants may be free but they did not own their land. So we really do see a big division between the rich and the poor in Spain. Now we'll look at the army as a long-term cause for the Spanish Civil War. Now the army was really a conservative organization, mainly filled with aristocratic officers. But what we see with the army during this time is that it had two factions, the mainland army and the Spanish Foreign Legion. And we'll be talking about both moving forward through this unit. Uh, this brings us probably to our most important key figure of the Spanish Civil War, someone we'll be talking at great lengths about, General Francisco Franco. He was in command in Morocco until he was transferred to the Canary Islands. He and his top men believed the army had the right and duty to protect the Spanish nation even against the state itself. So they felt the, uh, the, the state wasn't doing justice for Spain. They had the right to go in and take it over. So this army would support the right-wing political parties, the right-wing, the more the nationalist front. Now, if, if, the, if the left, the elected government in Spain, couldn't maintain order, what would or could the generals do? Well, really, the generals would see this as an opportunity for a military coup. The army was really both a long and short-term cause of the Spanish Civil War. They conducted the coup which started the Civil War, to help preserve old world conservative privilege that the army was enjoying. Next, we're going to look at regional differences within Spain and how that became a long term cause of the Spanish Civil War. So we're going to look at a few different of uh, a few different regions within Spain. The first one we'll talk about is Catalonia the Catalonian region, which is on the northwest coast. You can see it on the map there in the teal color. We see the Basque region on the, the north border in the purple region there. 
and we see Asturias region in, in orange. We also have the Pyrenees region. I don't think I've included that as a point, but they are also included. Um, basically, all these different regions within Spain consider themselves independent regions. Um, they had their own languages, they had their own folklore, they had their own myths, so they all had their own histories and own cultures, and it didn't really mix. And all of this really, you could trace all of this really back to the Roman Empire if you go back far enough. In 1931, Catalonia had for a short time declared themselves a republic. In 1932, the Spanish government grants them autonomy. Doesn't grant them independence, but gives them more autonomy, more self, uh, or self governance. And as a result, gradually the Catalonian people move toward the left side of the political spectrum. Trade unionists, communists, socialists, and anarchists recruited supporters among the workers. The Basque, on the other hand, were nationalists. The region was mainly conservative and monarchist and Catholic. It was mainly made up of peasants, and it was more really countryside versus town. Limited opportunity drew resentment towards Madrid, the capital of Spain, and especially Catalonia. Some of these divisions were based on class differences that really go back to feudal society, which involved the Catholic Church and land-owning nobility and the army. Regional differences, which really could be dated back to the time of the Roman Empire, which had never been reconciled. So all these differences became entangled in new political factionalism and economic disputes. Everyone was pushing their political agenda into centuries-old divisions. Now for a look at the short-term causes of the Spanish Civil War. In October of 1934, Republican government came into serious difficulties. On their plate, they have to deal with two revolutions, one in Cat uh, Catalonia and the second one in Astorias, which is on the northwest coast there in the, uh, in the orange on the map. The army restored order, but um, 1,300 people were killed, perhaps 1,200 more executed afterwards. But what we really want to remember, and most important, is that about 30,000 political prisoners were put in jail. So kind of remember that for now. The next short-term cause we're going to look at is the general election that was held in 1936. With this man here, Jose Gil Robles, um, and CIDA, which is really that uh, coalition of conservative political parties. Under his leadership, they run a campaign that is really inspired by Hitler's Nuremberg rallies. So Gil Robles was really inspired and was really kind of playing Hitler's playbook here. And that's going to cause a lot of Republicans to kind of move more left on the political spectrum. They're going to leave the, the kind of the right and go to the left. And the remaining Republicans ended up in a coalition with monarchists and agrarians and would become the national front. So on the left side, we're going to have the um, the popular front, and on the right side, we're going to have the national front. Now on the far right, 
of the National Front, we're going to have the Falangi. Okay? Um, on the far right, we're going to have the Falangi, which were the fascists. That's the fascist political party of Spain. And there is their flag. In opposition was the entire left wing, which was made up now of socialists, communists, liberals, anarchists. Together, they would be known as the Popular Front. After the election, it was clear that the Popular Front had won. Voters were drawn to the two extreme ends of the political spectrum. The new government was a liberal one, elected democratically, and would be the legal Spanish government from 1936 to 1939. So after their uh, newly elected win, the Popular Front, are now the legal Spanish government in Spain, they immediately release the political prisoners who were in jail since 1934. And I'm sure many regular criminals kind of snuck out as well or were also released. And social unrest rose in the cities and countryside at this time. June 1936, 700,000 workers in Madrid went on strike in the countryside. Peasants attacked the local Catholic church and looted the local estates. Uh, the picture at the bottom here with the caption, pillaging and desecration of church institutions by supporters of the Republicans. The corpses of nuns from a monastery in Barcelona were ripped out of graves and displayed on a wall. Pretty grim. After the election in February, offers, officers in the Foreign Spanish Legion began planning a revolt. And this would be a three-pronged attack. There would be a southern attack. That would be led by Francisco Franco. Attack from Morocco and move into southern Spain. There would be a northeastern attack would be by General Gaudet, would take Barcelona and subdue Catalonia. And the leader of the entire opposition, General San Giorgio, would fly from Portugal and attack Madrid from the north. In July of 1936, assassination of prominent government official and monarchist Jose Calvo Sotelo occurs. Francisco Franco asks Mussolini, who's going to give him uh, bomber and fighter planes, and Hitler, who will provide transport planes, for military aid to get his foreign legion back to Spain. Taking Madrid would not be so easy easy as planned italy would take the it would take the it would take the nationalists and the phalangi three long bloody years of battle before closing in on madrid they were helped by foreign intervention the german nazis and the italian fascists the popular front was aided by the soviet union and what became known as the International Brigade. This was made up of 30,000 volunteers from 53 countries, including the United States and Canada. Meanwhile, peasants and workers would take up arms to settle old scores. And that's where we're going to stop our talk today. Thank you very much. Goodbye.